a summer weekend, three friends embarked on a caving adventure in Kentucky's Buzzard Roost Cave. What started as an exciting exploration quickly turned into a nightmare. With the allure of adventure driving them, they had no idea the deadly peril that awaited. By the end of their journey, only two would make it out alive. This is the true tragedy of the Buzzard Roost cave disaster. On May 28, 1993, the small town of Cave City, Kentucky was bustling with tourists enjoying the Memorial Day weekend. Among the crowd were three friends, William Coughlin, James Jacala, and Kevin Feely. They had driven from Illinois, their hearts set on exploring the Buzzard Roost Cave. William Coughlin, a 27-year-old environmentalist from Oak Forest, had a deep love for the outdoors. His passion for nature and adventure led him to caving, an activity that offered him a new world to explore. Despite his limited experience, William was driven by curiosity and a desire to conquer the unknown. His friends, James and Kevin, shared his enthusiasm, making them the perfect team for this daring expedition. Buzzard Roost Cave was famous for its challenging and dangerous paths. It was not a place for beginners. The cave's brochure highlighted two tours, a historic tour and a wild cave tour. The historic tour was a guided walk through accessible areas. The wild cave tour, on the other hand, offered a real challenge, requiring crawling, twisting, and squeezing through narrow passages. The friends decided to start with the historic tour to get a feel for the cave. The cave's entrance was an unassuming hole in the ground, leading into darkness. As they descended, the temperature dropped and the air grew damp. Stalactites hung from the ceiling like ancient chandeliers, and the floor was slick and uneven. Despite the warnings about the cave's dangers, the friends felt a rush of excitement, but their excitement soon turned to dread. What was supposed to be a thrilling journey became a fight for survival. Why did things go so terribly wrong? How did a simple adventure turn into a deadly nightmare? The historic tour was fascinating. Their guide, Dave Harden, shared stories about the cave's history and pointed out interesting rock formations. The friends marveled at the underground world, feeling like explorers in a lost world. After the tour, they felt confident and ready for the real adventure, the Wild Cave Tour. Before embarking on the Wild Cave Tour, they signed a release form acknowledging the risks. The form's language was stern, warning of serious injury or death. But the friends, driven by adrenaline and excitement, signed it without hesitation. Kevin, however, decided to sit out this tour and explore the surface attractions instead. William and James, along with four other adventurous tourists, were handed two handheld flashlights each. Dave, their guide, explained the rules, stick together, follow the leader, and navigate the cave as a team. He emphasized the importance of caution, reminding them of the cave's deadly reputation. The tour began with a series of tight passages that required crawling on hands and knees. The walls closed in and the ceiling dipped low. Despite the physical challenge, the group moved steadily. William and James, though inexperienced, were thrilled by the adventure. Their hearts pounded with excitement as they maneuvered through the cave. After crawling for what seemed like an eternity, they reached a 30-foot hanging cable ladder with wooden rungs. Dave went first, demonstrating how to climb. One by one, the group followed. The ladder swayed, making the climb nerve-wracking. Once everyone was down, they crawled a short distance to a second, shorter but more challenging ladder. The ladder hung over a rock partition, making it difficult to grip the rungs properly. The group's confidence grew as they descended the second ladder. Dave then announced that the official tour had ended and they were free to explore nearby passages. He left them at the bottom of the ladder, saying he needed to make a quick phone call. William and James decided to climb back up the second ladder to explore a passage that had caught William's eye earlier. William grabbed the ladder and began to climb. He was a big guy, six feet tall and about 220 pounds. The ladder was unsteady under his weight, and he struggled to maintain his grip. 
Halfway up, he decided to take a break, hoping Dave would return soon to help. But impatience got the better of him, and he decided to try again. This time, as he climbed, he lost his grip and slipped off the ladder. William's fall was swift and brutal. He hit his head on a protruding rock and landed heavily on the cave floor. Blood poured from a gash on his scalp, and he was barely conscious. James rushed to his side, panic surging through him. William was delirious, not fully understanding what had happened. Dave returned to find chaos. William was severely injured, and the group was frantic. Dave insisted they had to climb out the way they came in, but William was in no condition to climb. He needed immediate medical attention. James argued with Dave, demanding a rescue operation. The guide hesitated, worried about causing a panic among the tourists above ground. The group decided to try getting William out themselves. They managed to push and pull him up the ladder, a grueling task that took all their strength. But the real challenge was yet to come. They had to get him through a narrow, V-shaped passage. This passage was a nightmare, barely wide enough for a person to crawl through. William, with his large frame, was terrified of getting stuck. As they maneuvered William into the passage, he became wedged, unable to move forward or backward. Panic set in. The group tried pulling him out, but the more they pulled, the more stuck he became. William's breathing grew labored, his lungs compressed by the tight space. His breath was gurgly, a sign of fluid in his lungs. James ran to the surface to get help. He told the cave owner about William's accident, but the response was slow. The owner and Dave seemed reluctant to call for a rescue, fearing bad publicity. Precious hours ticked by before they finally alerted the authorities. When rescue personnel arrived, they found William in dire condition. He was angled downward, his body filling the crevice. The temperature in the cave was around 44 degrees Fahrenheit, and William was at risk of hypothermia. They used chemical heat blankets and heaters to keep him warm. A pulley system was set up to try and extract him, but the process was slow and painful. Rescuers worked tirelessly through the night, but progress was minimal. William's condition worsened. By Saturday afternoon, after hours of futile efforts, he was pronounced dead. The official cause of death was compressive and positional asphyxia. His body was finally removed from the cave on Monday afternoon, almost three days after he had entered. The aftermath was devastating. William's parents, John and Marge Coughlin, were heartbroken. John described the situation as a comedy of errors that cost his son his life. James, traumatized by the experience, struggled with nightmares and guilt. The Kentucky State Police investigated the incident, the first cave-related death in the area in over two decades. The legal battle that followed William's tragic death was intense and emotionally charged. The Coughlin family, devastated by the loss of their son, sought justice for what they believed was gross negligence on the part of the cave operators. They argued that the operators had failed to provide adequate warnings about the cave's inherent dangers and hadn't taken necessary precautions to ensure the safety of inexperienced cavers like William and his friends. The lawsuit was filed against the cave operators and the tour guide, Dave Harden, who had led the fateful Wild Cave Tour. The Coughlin's attorney argued that the release form the group signed was misleading and did not fully disclose the severe risks involved in the tour. Moreover, the family claimed that the guide and the cave owner had been reckless in their handling of the emergency, delaying critical rescue operations. The case went to court, and the proceedings revealed troubling details about the management of the cave tours. Witnesses testified that the safety briefings were inadequate and that the equipment provided to the group was insufficient for the level of difficulty and danger posed by the Wild Cave Tour. The court heard about the lack of helmets, inadequate lighting, and the absence of additional safety gear that experienced cavers would consider essential. One of the key points in the trial was the guide's decision to leave the group alone in the cave while he made a phone call. This action was deemed highly irresponsible, especially given the hazardous nature of the cave environment. 
During the trial, expert cavers testified about the standard safety protocols that should have been in place for such a tour. They emphasized that the guide's actions, coupled with the lack of proper equipment, significantly increased the risk of a tragic outcome. In its ruling, the court held the cave operators and the tour guide accountable for William's death. The judge stated that the operators had a responsibility to provide a safe environment and that their failure to do so constituted negligence. The court emphasized that while adventure sports carry inherent risks, the organizers must mitigate those risks as much as possible, especially when dealing with inexperienced participants. The court awarded the Coughlin family significant damages, recognizing the profound loss they had suffered. This tragic story serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of caving. It underscores the importance of proper preparation, equipment, and respect for nature's power. William's passion for adventure and the outdoors was admirable, but his inexperience and the negligence of those responsible for his safety led to a heartbreaking end. Stay tuned for more stories of cave tragedies, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more gripping tales.